All right, I thought today, as we enter into our sermon time, I thought maybe this time we'd talk about the Bible. What do you say? And some of you are thinking, well, yeah, Pastor, we expect you to talk about the Bible. I just, maybe not really getting into what it says right away, but just like some, some difficult things about the Bible. Because there are difficult things in the Bible, right? There are things in the Bible that we don't necessarily understand. They're confusing. Um, there are things in the Bible that we don't like what it says. And so it's kind of like we just want to sweep them under the rug, right? We don't want to go there because uh, that's difficult for our lives. So there are difficult things in the Bible. But, you know, in, in addition to the difficult things, there are just some downright weird things in the Bible, right? Who's ever been reading your Bible and you come across something and you're like, that is just, that's weird. What do I even do with that? I mean, things like you just like, forget about putting it to practice in our lives. I don't even know what that means or how that means anything, right? Lots of stuff in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, there's some freaky stuff. I mean, it's just weird. I think just of the book of Revelation alone, anyone who's ever cracked that open and has read that paragraph and that, you're like, well, but I think about chapter 17, where there is a drunk woman dressed in shimmering gold, riding on the back of a beast with seven heads wearing ten crowns. And you try to picture that and you're like, it's just crazy. It's weird, right? It's just odd. I think of weird things in the New Testament, like the time uh, we read about it in Matthew 17, Peter's being harassed by some people to pay some taxes at the temple. And Jesus says, hey Peter, you know, I'm exempt from paying taxes at the temple because that's, that's a tax for God. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of him, so I'm exempt. But we don't want to offend people. So Peter, to get the money for the tax, I want you, since you're a fisherman, I want you to go out and start fishing, and the first fish you pull out, you open that fish's mouth, and there's going to be the money in there, all the money you need to pay your taxes. So hey, come tax time here uh, in the next few weeks or up through April 15th, you need some tax money, you just go fishing, right? No, it's weird. I mean, it's just strange. My favorite weird thing in, in well, one of my favorite weird things in the New Testament is recorded for us in the book of Acts chapter 20, and it's the Apostle Paul, and he's preaching to some people in an upper room. All right, they're in an upper room or somewhere, and he's preaching. And scripture actually says, and I quote, Paul went on and on. In fact, the indication is that they started meeting at their gathering at around dinner time, and scripture says it's now midnight. Now, and so there's this guy there, a young man, and he's sitting in the window, maybe he's trying to get some fresh air as Paul is talking, and he just can't help himself. He's trying and trying and trying, but he falls asleep. Now, some of you understand what this is like. Some of you understand what this is like every week. Uh, but I want you to understand, like, if sometimes I seem like I'm dry or long-winded, just think you could be listening to the Apostle Paul preach on and on and on from supper until midnight. And how about that, right? But, uh, you know, what happens is this man falls asleep, and because he's sitting in the window, he falls out backwards out the window, and he plummets three stories to his death. Ah, and this could be a disaster, but Paul, he's not concerned. He just kind of goes, no, 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 no. And he grabs the guy and he kind of picks him up and ah, he's alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has been brought back to life. And so that's, that's a great story. But it's just weird. I mean, death by boring sermon. Uh, I mean, it's just weird stuff, right? There's weird stuff in the Bible, even in the New Testament. And a lot of the weirdest stuff comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. I mean, we tend to think we, we know about Jesus and the kind of things he's going to say, but he says some weird things, like John chapter 6, verse 54, when he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now, when we delve into that, we see that that's an important thing he's saying, but he's saying, hey, to have life, you need to eat my body and you have to drink my blood. And that's weird. I mean, that's weird. So weird that the people listening to him at the time, they started grumbling and they left and they just stopped following Jesus. It's just too weird. I mean, there are weird things in the Bible, weird things that Jesus says. And isn't that kind of our temptation sometimes? They get so weird, we don't even want to listen to them. We just kind of grumble and go away. It's like, what does that mean? Case in point, this is the, 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 the weird thing we're going to look at that Jesus said today. Sandy, this is what he says. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And that's weird. Jesus saying he did not come to bring peace. I mean, aren't we told that the only hope for peace in our lives is through Jesus Christ? And didn't we just get done singing a song where we declare that Jesus is our Prince of Peace? And we're going to live our life for him. And in Romans chapter 12, we are told as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As followers of Jesus, live at peace. We're told to make peace. So it's kind of weird and even awkward and frustrating that Jesus would come and say, 
I've not come to make peace. I've not come to bring peace. What's Jesus talking about here? You see, I, I think to understand, we need to first look at the very first thing he says there. He says, do not suppose that I came to bring peace. Don't suppose. Translation, don't assume I came to bring you peace. You know, it, it seems apparently the people Jesus was talking to, and in this case, the scripture makes it clear, he's talking to the disciples, the twelve. It seems that they were supposing some stuff about him. They were assuming some stuff about Jesus, right? Uh, and, and he says, don't suppose you know. Now, first off, that, that, that's like... Uh, uh, a message for us right there, a warning. Because we all have a tendency, don't we, to suppose stuff about Jesus. We suppose we know about Jesus. We suppose we know what he's about. We suppose we know what he wants. We suppose we know what his plan is and how he's going to accomplish it and what he's going to do and how he's going to work through us. And we suppose, and we get ahead of God when we suppose things. And when you're ahead of God, you're out there by yourself, right? So Jesus says first, don't suppose. Don't do it. The disciples, they're apparently supposing some stuff uh, about Jesus. They're supposing that he came to bring peace. And most likely, they think this because they recognize him as the Messiah, the promised anointed one who would come and rule for God. And they recognize him as the Messiah. We know this because at one point, Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, one of the twelve, he speaks right up and he says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. So they recognize Jesus as the Messiah, even when most people don't. And they recognize him as Messiah. And having recognized him as that, they also probably know the prophecy given by Isaiah 600 years beforehand uh, that includes another name for the Messiah, which is Prince of Peace. Which, which There's that term again. So, you know, perhaps they're thinking, they're uh, uh, supposing that following Jesus and being with Jesus meant everything would be peaceful and calm and easy because he's going to come, he's going to be the Prince of Peace and it's going to be peaceful. Jesus says, don't suppose that. I didn't come to bring peace. So if he didn't come to bring peace, what did Jesus come to bring? And we see it right there. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Oh, Jesus comes to bring a sword. Okay, wow. How often when we picture Jesus, do we picture him with a sword going through and slashing at people? That's not the picture of Jesus we get, right? But he says, I've come to bring a sword. What do you get with a sword? You, you get conflict. You get war. Um, the original language that Jesus used here, it has a connotation of division. He says, I've come to bring a sword. I've come to bring division. Again, this doesn't sound like Jesus. Jesus bringing division? That's weird stuff. So we wonder, what's he getting at? And he goes on to tell us by giving us some more weird stuff. He goes on and he says this, For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Jesus quotes the prophet Micah here, and he says these things. And again, Jesus is pretty much saying, I've come to bring strife to families. And that's weird. Because what? Because aren't we taught in church that the power of Jesus can help us heal broken relationships? And doesn't following Jesus make, uh, help us make peace with our families? And doesn't Jesus heal families that have fallen apart when they submit to him? And the answer to all those questions is yes. So what's Jesus talking about when he says these weird things? What's he getting at? And I can sum it up for you. I can sum it up for you all in one word. Jesus is talking about loyalty. Loyalty. Jesus is saying, hey, those of you who follow me, I call you to loyalty to me and to me only. So uh, he, he's saying, uh, you, your first loyalty is to me. Your first loyalty in your life is no longer yourself. It's no longer your family, or maybe your friends, or the other people in your life. So your first loyalty is not to your wife, not to your husband, not to your kids, not to your parents. No, it is to Jesus. And that's hard. 
That's hard because sometimes we can get messed up loyalties. We can get divided loyalties, right? That's why Jesus is talking about this here. We get divided loyalties because, you know, we don't get mothers and daughters against each other because they're loyal to each other instead of being loyal to Jesus. And it's hard. We get these upset loyalties. Case in point, I, um, at the Super Bowl last year, there was a Seahawks fan who had tickets. It's, it's Super Bowl Sunday, so I can talk about the Super Bowl. Uh, they had tickets, and he was enjoying himself, but he had really bad tickets. And as he surveyed the place with his binoculars, he saw a seat that was open right on the 50-yard line, kind of close to the front. And as he observed this, as the game went on, it remained empty, and he thought, what a shame. So he gathered up all his things, and he goes down to the seat, and, and he goes up, and he says to the man sitting next to the empty seat, he says, is this seat taken? And the other man replies, no, that was supposed to be my wife's seat, but she's not here. And uh, the first man asks, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Why, why couldn't she come to the game? And the second man says, oh, well, well, she passed away. But we had these tickets beforehand, so I came. And it's a shame, too, because she was a huge Seahawks fan, almost as big a Seahawks fan as I am. And the first man kind of gives his condolences again, and he sits down, but, but he, he has to ask them, and he says, wait, with how, how highly sought after these seats are and how expensive they are, couldn't you find anyone, a friend or a relative, to come and take this seat? And the second man says, yes, I, I tried, but they're all at the funeral. Oh. oh, divided loyalties, right? I mean, where's the loyalty there? But that's how often we live with divided loyalties like that. Jesus says, if you follow me, no, 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 if you really follow me, then there's no divided loyalty. In our loyalty to Jesus, we follow him into this new life, and that's the life we live by, which means we must be constantly changing things in our lives to live according to loyalty to Jesus. We change our attitudes. We change our priorities. We change what we think is important in life. We change what we do for fun or what we think is fun. We change what we live our lives for. We change how we interact with the people in this world. We leave worldliness behind, and we pursue that holy life. That's loyalty, undivided loyalty to Jesus. And guess what happens when we do that? There are going to be some people in our lives, friends and family, who don't like that. You see, they like it when we live according to their priorities. They live according to their expectations. And they like it when we're living lives that don't convict them of how they're living. They don't like it when we say, I can't do that with you, or I can't support you in that because of my loyalty to Jesus Christ. They don't like it when in our loyalty to Jesus, we talk about our faith, or we share our faith with them. We invite them into our faith. They don't like it. And guess what that causes? It causes, what, distress, division. That's the sword Jesus says he came to bring. That's it. Your loyalty, loyalty to Jesus will cause division in this world. Jesus warns us about it here. Um, and Jesus says, don't suppose it's supposed to be any different. It's going to cause division in your family, sometimes people in your own households, and your friends, there's going to be division there. And he's not telling us to go and deliberately, you know, cause conflict in our relationships. No, that's not what he's saying. Don't go with a holier-than-thou attitude, constantly shoving your religion in somebody else's face who's not a follower of that religion. Don't go deliberately making division when it doesn't need to be there. But stay loyal to living the life that Jesus calls you to. And well, that will cause division. Jesus knows that. So he warns us about it here. And when it comes, when that division comes, our role then is to be the peacemaker. But be warned by what Jesus says here. Peace might not come. Jesus says it come to bring the sword. But the thing is, we don't like division, do we? We don't like conflict. I, I know I don't. So our tendency, what's our tendency so often when, when we're faced with this? Our tendency is to divide our loyalties, right? Because right? We, don't, we don't want the conflict. When someone in our lives doesn't like how we follow Jesus so closely, well, to avoid conflict, well, we'll just back off a little bit on that, that loyalty to Jesus when we're around them, right? Isn't that what we do? And when, when they draw us into the sin in their life, well... It's not that bad. It's just something small. So yeah, in the name of peace, I'm going to go along with them on it. All right? And then we come back to Jesus, and we're all loyal to him on Sunday morning. I might say that if you have never been at odds with the people in your life who don't follow Jesus, then this might be the attitude you've adopted. It's divided loyalties. 
Sure, divided loyalties are going to bring peace. It's going to avoid the sword, but Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring the sword. I came so you would have loyalty to me. And he makes it clear, you cannot, as a follower of his, you cannot have a divided loyalty. You cannot. And he uses strong language. This is what he goes on to say here. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I mean, this is how strong loyalty is to Jesus. You will take up a cross for him. Now, in in the disciples' day, in Jesus' day, the the disciples knew just as well as we did what it meant to carry a cross. Because it was part of their culture. It was an instrument of brutal punishment and death, even before Jesus died on it. And people convicted of death by crucifixion had to take up their cross beam and carry it the whole way to the place where they would be killed on it. So Jesus here, he's using a metaphor and he's saying, hey, look at this. This is violent, isn't it? This is loyalty to me. Jesus here is saying in a way, being loyal to him is like carrying a cross. You sacrifice your life to be a loyal follower of Jesus. If need be, you put to death everything in your formal life, former life, including the relationships with your family, with your friends, to follow after Jesus loyally. And he goes on and he puts it this way. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. Isn't that something? Family and friends are going to want things contrary to what Jesus wants. So where's your loyalty going to be in those times? Jesus says, if you will not do this, if you cannot give me your complete loyalty, you are not worthy of me. And too often we make up excuses or we make up justifications, right, for not giving Jesus our complete loyalty. Because taking up the cross, right, welcoming the sword into our relationships, it's just more than we're willing to pay. But following after Jesus is costly. It's costly in our relationships, in our lives, and it's costly across the board. In everything in our life, it's costly. Who told you being loyal to Jesus would be easy? Who told you loyalty to Jesus it wouldn't come at a cost? Who told you it wouldn't require hard work and sacrifice in your everyday life? Who told you it wouldn't require giving up everything in you, your hopes, your dreams, your relationships, your plans for your life? Who told you loyalty to Jesus meant comfort and ease and everything was going to go the way exactly that you wanted to? It's certainly not anything I've ever taught, and it's nothing Jesus teaches. Because Jesus is clear here. Jesus teaches, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Calling us to loyalty. Loyalty that will cause division with those not loyal to Jesus. It's why Jesus came to this earth. And this loyalty Jesus calls us to, what does it mean to be... uh, Loyal to Jesus and only Jesus. It's not just a decision you make once in your life. As if we can think, well, I gave my life to Jesus way back then so I can go now and and do and think and believe and, and, and pursue whatever I want. No, loyalty to Jesus is a choice we make over and over again each and every day. In every situation we're in, we have to make that decision to be loyal to Jesus. It's just like carrying a cross. It's a decision to carry that cross beam every step along the way. It's like when we're on a diet. Like right now, this is heavy in my mind because I'm trying to uh, eat more healthy and I'm trying to exercise because I put on some weight I don't necessarily like and I want to take it off, right? So I'm trying to do those things. But that's not a one-time choice. It's not as though I just woke up one morning and says, all right, I'm going to eat healthy and exercise and ah, the weight just fell off. No, if I think that, I'm going to fail, right? It has to be constant decision over and over and over again. Every day, every moment, every time I walk past some junk food and I want more, I have to make that choice. No, I don't want junk food. Or if it's dinner time and I want a bigger portion, no, I have to make that choice. Or every morning when that alarm goes off 45 minutes earlier than it used to so I can get up and exercise before I come into the church each morning, I have to decide, make that decision, I'm not going to roll back over in bed for 45 minutes. Right? It's that constant decision. And loyalty to Jesus is the same way. It's not a one-time decision. Undivided loyalty is constant decision-making. In each and every moment, in each and every situation, in each and every relationship. Where are we going to be loyal? That's the question. Where are our loyalties today? Jesus makes clear there can be no divided loyalties. 
in his followers. There's, there's no division there. Some of us have divided loyalties, and we think we're getting away with it. We think we can get away with it, but I assure you, Jesus knows where your loyalties lie. He's not fooled at all. But, but there is something. Jesus, as he closes out these comments, he, he does tell us that those who give up our lives to be fully loyal to Jesus, he makes this promise. And it's a good one. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Loyalty to Jesus will bring division with some on this earth. But it also brings life. So today, search your loyalties. When you leave here today, leave as one set on no divided loyalties. Loyalty to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Let's pray.